Welcome, we're the Macomb County Genealogy Group. You can find MCGG at our blog website, on Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and at our YouTube channel. You can contact us at either of the listed emails seen here. The MCGG Friday Group has been meeting for over 48 years and our MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy Discussion Group has been meeting for 16 years. During this pandemic and the library's renovation, we are meeting virtually once a month as a combined meeting. Many MCGG members volunteer their time in a variety of ways to benefit the genealogy community and the Mount Clemens Public Library. This is the MCGG Friday, an MCGG Let's Talk Genealogy combined virtual meeting, November 10th, 2021. Our topic tonight is War Year 1943 in Macomb County, presented by Beverly Bishop. If this is your first time attending a MCGG meeting, welcome. Attend a meeting and you are a member. MCGG has no dues. If you would like to be added to our mailing list, please send an email to the email shown on the screen. We try to keep our emails down to a reasonable number each month, mostly meeting reminders. I'm going to start off with some announcements. Um, okay, for those of you with French um, ancestors over in France and all that, my heritage bought a French genealogy company earlier. I think it was announced November 2nd. Um, and they have added a large amount of French records to my heritage itself. Um, these are digitized and they're indexed for the most part. And there is a video or webinar that was just done yesterday on Legacy Family Tree webinars, which my heritage owns now. And it's free to view. And because it was done by a my heritage employee, it's free forever. So, um, take a look at that and learn how to do it. And then of course, most of you should know that um, uh, Michigan residents have access to My Heritage Library Edition through the Michigan Electronic Library, uh, or if you have a Library of Michigan library card, which is free and you can click the label on our blog website and uh, you can learn how to get a library card from the Library of Michigan if you don't have it. Uh, let's see, what else was on the list of announcements? <laughs> um, one good piece of news from our favorite library, Mount Clemens Public Library, thanks to Teresa and Brittany. Um, the, since the public internet has been added back and it's been expanded so that um, even you... The, Technically, you can't stay in the library for a long time. Um, you can sit out in your car in the parking lot and use their um, internet services. Right now, you can access uh, some of the databases, but as of Monday, um, hopefully Monday, we'll, you know, we'll work on timing and all that, um, you will have access to Ancestry Library Edition and Family Search Affiliate. So um, we can do some very cold tailgating genealogy research in the parking lot. So <laughs> if you've got your blankie and your uh, hand and wa toe warmers, um, you can bring your lawn chair <laughs> and camp out there for a while. So we'll let you know when it's actually up and running. Um, and if you're adventurous and you really need a record from Family Search Affiliate, um, you can get it. Um, was there anything else I was supposed to announce? I think that was it. Okay. All right, Bob, take away. Oh, before we do that, um, everyone, uh, shut off your video and mute your sound so we can enjoy Beverly's presentation. Go ahead, Bob. All right. I'd like to present the Macomb County Genealogy Group's own Beverly Bishop, 
who has a pharmacist degree from Wayne State University and a doctorate from Midwestern University of Chicago. Bev was raised in Roseville, but has lived in Mount Clemens now for 41 years. Bev enjoys local historical and geneal genealogical groups. Tonight's program is War Year 1943 in Macomb County. Sit back and enjoy Bev's presentation woven from 1943's front pages of the Monitor Leader newspapers. Take it away, Bev. And I wanted to talk tonight about World War II, basically 1943 only. Not when we started the war, not when we ended the war, right down the middle where we're just not sure how it's going to turn out. And the news from the home front is very literal. This picture is my home front. It is my home that when I moved to Mount Clemens, I bought. Um, and what you see there are uh, two stars in the window. This is 1943, and it is the younger son of two sons that you see in front of the house. Claude built the house. His son, Gerald, is standing here. He has come home from the war to attend his brother's funeral in this house, 122 Lodwick. And I'm asking you to just step into 1943. Just join me in a very black and white world. It really was. It was a different time. Look at the very top of this picture. It has all of the wires. Those were going to the interurbans, to the trolleys. But in addition, the buses were already encroaching on the roads. You can see them in a long line. And also the cars, more and more and more by 1943, there were cars. People still walked, though. They would catch a trolley line. They would jump. I'm sure they weighed 10 pounds less than we do for all their running. They wore hats. They carried briefcases. They shared the road with whichever group was marching down it that day. Might have been sailors, might have been army. Uh, we really didn't have Air Force, but we had cadets at that time. And that was part of bringing a river of enthusiasm to the, the time so that you would buy a bond and support this war. Women wore dresses and hats and waited at bus stations. So this is the 1943, please embrace it. Oh, sorry, goes fast. Mid-war year, 1943, there's so much drama. Robert has died in training. He comes home to the Copeland house. The Copelands can no longer live there by November and they have to move out. And then the Ward family moves in in November. Fast forward 40 years, and the wards move out in November and I move in in November. Also in this particular house, their Robert dies. The next Robert, the ward Robert is an instructor at Michigan State University for over 50 years. And he is surviving to this day and communicates with me. And then my son, Robert, moved in with us when we moved in. There are a lot of commonalities and similarities, like it's just hooked together. So how did those people cope, literally? How did the Copelands cope? Well, they cope by leaving the house. They were so overwrought with the war. Also, Mr. Copeland was involved at the pottery. And of course, on April 1st, they started a lawsuit against the pottery. So losing his son, having difficulty, uh, it was a tough time. So how did everybody get through it? Well, someone luckily left off an entire bin of all the Monitor Leader newspapers, just the front page. And of course, uh, it was connected to like the last page of the first section. And I could lift it up and there were the obituaries. So what I got was the first page and the obituaries. And I just, it was amazing. I just couldn't keep my hands off of all of 1943. So I took them all up north with me to my cabin and I separated them all out into the months and then chronologically by date. And then I started weaving the different stories that would start say February and end in December. And I could weave these stories together for beginnings and ends. And it was so fascinating. So that's what I wanted to share with you is what happened here in Mount Clemens and in Macomb County. 
And then I started looking at other histories, magazines, movies. It all interwove into what these people were doing. I talked to people. My mother was 10 years old on this date. So um, she could tell me from a child's point of view what was going on. <clears throat> Pretty soon I was collecting artifacts, every kind of thing, to turn my house into a wartime look. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for the holiday walk in December 2016, I even had a lit cigarette. I used everything I could find to make it 1943, and it was just wondrous. So those are my methods for how I did this. And I'm going to walk you from January to December. So hold tight, because in an hour, we're going to push through 12 months of information. First of all, not each month is equal. There's only three slides for December, but wait till you get to June. It was a big, big, big month. So, okay, in January, here we go. We're going to plan our victory garden. It is your duty as an American to back this war and to develop your victory garden. And that's what made the front pages. And you had to obtain a mail order form so that you could order all of your seeds, which might take months to get to you because they weren't getting really consistent mail. Uh, I, I think we're aware of that. And then by the end of the summer, you should have enough to do your own canning. So there would also be canning and there would be tips on what you could make with things, things that maybe you had never used before, kohlrabi or all different kinds of vegetables that you can grow. So that at the end of the year, you should have your carrots and potatoes, onions, cabbage, your sweet potatoes and your tomatoes as basics. Also, you are not going to be able to buy any of your implements. Your shovels and your rakes, hose and twine are probably not on the shelves. Everything has gone to the war effort. You have to check the want ads. And if you have extra in your garage, put it out to the want ads for your neighbors. The next person in January who hits the front page is Captain Edward Rickenbacker. Of course, he's well known as Eddie Rickenbacker, especially in the Detroit area. Now, we knew him from World War I. He was out on Selfridge doing some training, and he was an ace flyer. He then, over the next 20 some years, became a consultant, an author, and an automaker. And so by 1942, President Roosevelt is asking him to please get into his plane and get out there to 43 stations across the world in about a month's time, 32 days, and report back to him. So he is to take copious notes and ask a million questions. And he was all business. What happened was on this worldwide mission, his plane crashed into the ocean. For 21 days, he was on a rubber raft. He wrote the book based on this adventure, seven came through. So in 1943, he's doing two things. He is promoting the war and he is promoting his book. So it had just come out. So here he is in January and he's got these things going and he comes to Detroit and he says, hey, you guys working in Detroit, what's with all these strikes? You know, if you were out on the front like I've been, you wouldn't see people complaining about long hours or not being able to go home on time or not getting a lunch break. And it's your job to get the war things to get out to those men and, and to pretty much be quiet. Well, pretty soon there was so much of this that people had to come forward and say, you know, he's wearing a kind of an outfit that looks like he's in the army, but he's not. And he's not speaking for the army and he's not doing the complaints. Uh, and also President Roosevelt actually came out and said, these are not my sentiments. So um, he was really holding their feet to the fire. And I happened to be lucky enough to get a copy of this seven came through and it is published in very rough paper because the publishing standards had changed so that we could save everything for the war effort and not be publishing books that were too fancy, too shiny. So that's it for January. You know, that was enough ruckus. Let's get to February 1943. And this, if you can remember anything, is the ration month. And we had been trying to do rationing, but it was very unclear and no one was really throwing in with it. 
But now in February, we had ration boards. We had people that were identified, a couple hundred men, to go ahead and provide your ration books, take in your old books, and clarify this. And what was on the list right now, and again, not every food, but it was coffee and it was all your canned foods, your shoes, your gas, things like that. Well, every adult could get a pound of coffee every six weeks. Adult means you're 14 years of age. Everybody can have three pairs of shoes per year. And if you own a car, you could get one to a maximum of three gallons of gas per week. And so some people actually got their horses out. It might have been for looks, but they were getting out their horses showing how they were throwing in with the war effort. They didn't need the gas. And so they didn't want you wasting gas with weekend, you know, Sunday driving. And then on February 13th, you had to go down and turn in your food inventory from what was in your kitchen and your ration book number one. You were to receive your ration book number two. So on February 20th, they stopped selling canned meat, fish and fruit and canned vegetables to stop hoarding. It's kind of like they knew in advance we were going to want toilet paper. So they just stopped selling it and made you wait until March 1. Then they came out in the paper and showed you exactly how to do this. And, and this almost required a class and how to figure it out, how to shop for canned goods under the point system. You have A, B, and C stamps that are good for the first ration period. So see up at the very corner here, A, B, C. These are worth eight points, five points, two points, one point. Use your eights and fives first so that you don't have to ask for change. That would be too difficult on the, the shop owners. So over here, they're even tearing out their eights and their five to show you. An eight plus an eight plus a five will get you 21 points. You don't need to use the one down here. So um, they, they really want you to do it in a very prescribed way. Well, what are you gonna do with these points? When you go to buy your food, you give your money and your points. The points go into a box and are supposed to be turned in to a ration stamp location, a center. But years after the war, they actually found boxes of these in the backs of the stores. It was overwhelming to the shopkeeper to have to turn in the right number of points to compensate for the food that they had purchased. But that was the basic idea. So down below, you see that 18 points plus 13 cents will buy you a can. Over here, oh, and mind her, her hair, mind her... Um, her hat. Women were very much encouraged to wear hats at the time, and it made them feel more official, more a part of things. And when you couldn't buy new clothes, sometimes you could at least buy a new hat. And over here, she is also wearing a hat, and she's talking to the store clerk. And she has figured out with her ration stamps that after she bought 56 cents worth of groceries, each thing had a point value. So that was worth 39 points. So bring out your cash, bring out your points. Meat was difficult because with meat, again, a black and white world, um, it was by the pound. So ham would be seven or eight, and this could change, you know, every couple weeks per pound of 51 cents a pound. So you would sit down at home with your wartime shopping guide and figure out each pound of ham, seven or eight points, each pound of butter, 16. Margarine was four. So what were they doing? They were pushing you to use the margarine and not the butter. It's a much better point for you. Peaches, 16 ounces, a pound. That would be 18 points. So maybe you should really be doing your own canning. So that's what comes to mind is that the points seem to really ration some things that would be in high demand and try and get you to use other things. Uh, so it's advertising. And then baby food, one jar of Gerber, which was available, one point. The baby shouldn't suffer. And tomato ketchup, 14 ounces was 15 points. So you would kind of ration yourself on ketchup or learn to make your own. People were allowed 16 points per week per person at the household for meat alone, just meat. So you had to figure that out too. 
And then what you got here was the OPA form, the Office of Price Administration, so that things didn't get wild and they kept the lid on prices. You had to report to them your consumer declaration. It was for processed foods and for coffee, and you had to hereby agree to these things. And then you would identify how much coffee. To make it a little bigger, I used an additional slide here. So it's the same information. Here's your coffee. The pounds of coffee that you owned, and this is a mistake, this came out in February. Why are we talking November 28th, 1942? Because there was lots of mistakes when you read the papers, when you read what they were trying to do with rationing, lots of mistakes. And it was because it was such a rush system and everybody was trying to do the best they could. But on this particular uh, sheet, way down at the bottom, the number of cans you have to declare was February 21, 1943, which is the correct date. So there was a lot of planning in advance, but not everything went smoothly. You figured out how many uh, pounds of coffee you had. You figured out how many people could have a pound and subtracted that number so that you could buy whatever was left over. And you were on your honor to be honest. Canned goods were the same thing. Any commercially canned good thing, um, soups, chili sauce, ketchup, fruit, vegetables, all of that had to be accounted for. But you could have as much as you wanted of canned olives, canned meat, pickles, relishes, jams, spaghetti in a can, I'm not sure they even had it, macaroni, noodles, and home canned foods. So then you would figure out how much you would still be allowed to buy when you went to buy it. Go down and turn this shitty in first. When that sheet got turned in, you then got your second war ration book. So here are copies of war ration books that came from all over Macomb County area. So I had quite a few of those and they would sometimes be filled out with your name, address and phone number and date and sometimes not. They would be stamped, sometimes not. And so you turned in your war ration book number one, you got your number two. And if you were due for it, you could get your five pounds of sugar coupon. It only allowed you to buy it. It didn't give you a free you know, bag. <laughs> and then you also had um, your alcohol. You were allowed so much um, alcoholic beverage to purchase, and you had to prove uh, that you were of the right age and everything. And then this last coupon I have sitting here on the slide is for your gas. And when you got your gas, they would punch the numbers. Also, there was a great deal of discussion about blackouts. So candles would be an important thing to have available because uh, we might suffer a blackout. We were the arsenal of democracy. And if we were to be bombed by an enemy, we would need to black ourselves out completely. Blackout curtains were very important at night. And we started practicing on Fridays at 11 p.m. blacking out our city. During these um, practices, they didn't turn off the streetlights. And there was like a big fuss about that. Well, why don't we turn them off? Well, maybe we should, but we aren't. It's just a practice. It's so funny. I think they argue just like we do these days. So um, the paper is very interesting in what they'll tell you about it. And here's our gentleman who is the grocer trying to figure out his new ration information. And you know, busy hands are happy hands. And one of the things they wanted you to do in February, January, maybe even in March, while it's cold outside and you can't plant or get out very much, keep your hands busy and use up every scrap that made you feel like you were a part of the war effort. These little glass holders were made from scraps of thread they were crocheted so that if these glasses were to sweat with ice cubes in them, it would catch it. Of course, all of our furniture at that time in 1943 would all be very nice wood that would scar. So you would have that uh, to do. And you could make that plus something called Swedish weaving. Swedish weaving is... Um, taking the thread and then lifting up uh, just a couple of threads in your, in your material and going under it and over it, under it and over it. 
And so you could take different colors and do this Swedish weaving. And then of course you would iron it. These are all materials that were cotton at the time. So women still were extremely busy trying to keep everything ironed. And this is an example of it. So this was a busy time for everyone, even February. If that's not enough, you can get a five cent how to knit for victory everything centered around victory and so you could make something very special if you had a, a husband a son a, a boyfriend in the navy or in the army um, marines so you could make the proper thing and many people were giving this away you could actually get this compliments of sunbright the safe and speedy cleanser, or there would be coupons in the paper that you could send in or mail in your nickel and get a copy of it so that you could now knit. Also, what you could be doing is giving yourself a home permanent. A permanent wave would be something maybe a couple ladies would get together and make it, you know, so your hair would be curly. Well, of course you wanna look beautiful because your man will be coming home from this war. And it's our job as women to keep ourselves beautiful. And so that was important. And up here it says over 15,000 sold in Mount Clemens during 1943. Isn't that amazing? 59 cents. So um, they're safe, non-toxic, no ammonia, get one. Also, it was a pastime to just go out to the movies. We had very little diversion, right? There were no um, televisions, internet, good heavens. Uh, the census in 1930 asked if you even had a radio. So most people by 1943, 13 years later, yes, they had radios, but not very many televisions. If they did, they they weren't in the masses in, at that particular time. That was more or less after the war. And Abbott and Costello were extremely popular. And in this picture here, you see, well, you know, Abbott is just taken with this young lady and she is wearing the most beautiful pompadour with her curly hair. And so uh, Lou Costello tries to keep him in line and there was movie after movie. Up here, here's another movie for Abbott and Costello, extremely popular in 43. And who else was popular? A famous painter. Rockwell paints Roosevelt's vision of the four freedoms. So in 42, Roosevelt had been giving speeches talking about the four freedoms that we should enjoy. They should be something that you're allowed to have no matter where you live in the world, but especially here in the United States. And the very first one is freedom of speech. The first two are of something and the next two are from something. You should be free of something. So, okay, freedom of speech. And this was on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post on February 20th. This gentleman belongs to a union and he is speaking his mind at a meeting. And that's what you should be allowed to do. He even has his information in his pocket here. He is not just spouting, he has the goods, he has the data, the information. And when you've got that, you should have freedom of speech. These were also made into war bond tours. They literally took the paintings, which are quite large, and brought them out for tours. And for you to come and look at them, you could buy your war bonds at the same time. And posters of these paintings were made. And again, this concept applies to all people the world over. Let's see. And this is the second one in um, February. So on February 27th, it's the freedom of worship. And his picture of this, again, a black and white world. It's interesting that they didn't use color in this one, or he didn't, Rockwell. And he says, each according to the dictates of his own conscience, you should be permitted to have the religion of your choice. It shouldn't overlap with politics. It shouldn't overlap with the government. Not only saying that about the United States, but everywhere. March. March, March, March. Um, Rockwell paints the third freedom from want. Nobody in the world should be starving. And this is on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post on March 6th. 
We could talk all day about this. It's so amazing. It's sparse, but there's enough food for everyone. And he's included all generations, all different kinds of food um, and ways to do it. So he didn't actually paint this from his mind. He staged it. He interviewed actors. He used people he knew, friends, family. And this one is freedom from want. And the very last one, freedom from fear. This made the cover on March 13th. And he is carrying a newspaper. He's a dad figure with his glasses, a learned man and a newspaper that talks about the bombings and the horrors of them. And our children should be protected from those horrors. And moms should be available like good moms are tucking in our kids. And there's a little doll because we have, we have cared for our children and gotten them the things they need and protected them. So that's the last freedom, the four freedoms. It was used in a whole variety of ways. Oh, dear. Get back there. Um, I don't know if your piece is covered up by this screen share. Okay. In this particular thing, they took that painting and made a poster of it and said, ours to fight for, our American families, freedom from fear. So they use these posters in a variety of ways. Interesting, right next to it, I'm showing you another poster where a hand is pouring a... a a frying pan full of grease and oil down to make bombs. Save the waste fats for explosives. Take them to your meat dealer and turn them in. So maybe we should be free of bombs, but we should be making them. Interesting time. FDR says March is Red Cross month. And he would like for $25 million to be collected. And um, that's kind of a goal. And he kicks this off with something very, very unusual. He is able to connect Admiral Nimitz and General Eisenhower, who were out in the field, literally, connect them on the radio broadcast and get them uh, to talk about why they need the money why they need help for these injured men, why they need the Red Cross to be at their elbow all the time, setting up the, the different uh, base hospitals and helping. So Macomb County gets a goal of $71,000. And uh, there are people who are volunteering men to look at that goal and figure out what the breakdown is for each city and make sure that we get it, that we have a program in place to get the money in. Warren is uh, told 48,000, Mount Clemens 11,000, Romeo 2,000, and then just over 1,000 in all the smaller outline, at the time they were smaller, Armada, Chesterfield, Clinton Township, who's so much bigger now, and Harrison Township. So did they make it? Well, yes, they did, very quickly. Again, this is March. By May 4th, they had more than 94 thousand dollars collected. So it worked. What are the other March headlines? Some of the headlines were that we have a new office of food production and distribution. You know, people were starving over in England. They were having a very difficult time. Uh, much effort was going into making sure we could get food production. And so we have a new office. Additionally, there is a new draft. The draft is looking at males who are 18 years to 38 years who are war workers. Well, what's a war worker? That is somebody who did not get drafted into the service and they are doing things that support the war and therefore they're exempt. So they looked at that group of men and said, well, how many are single? How many are childless if married? How many have other responsibilities? And they did an uh, evaluation of that, and it was in the newspapers quite heavily. And the next question is, well, okay, who's going to do the war work? Who's going to make the bombs? Go into the, and you and I, we know the answer to this, because we know about Rosie the Riveter. But they didn't. This was a new concept. So what about women? What about women? Should we let them? Can they do it? 70,000 women would probably be available to do it. 
non-war industry workers? Could we stop doing some things that are not essential? Some 40,000 men could be pulled there. How about the high school kids? At least 20K. How about commuters who live out in the sticks, out in the fields? Where can we pull them in and get them into war production? Yes, we can figure out ways to move them. What other March headlines? Well, that point system for rationing was in full swing. People were knuckling down and buckling down and accepting it finally. And the points were now changed on March 12th. Thanks a lot. We just got it figured out and they're changed again. Also, they made a new law that servicemen would be exempt from homestead taxes on their home. So if you owned a home and had to go into the service, you did not pay taxes, and that would extend to a duration of the war plus one year. And what would that do really to Macomb County to lose all the taxes on those homes, all the services? Uh, it, it was a big deal. And there was also a huge countywide recycling program. And on the front page of the newspapers, you could learn how to prepare your tin cans. You would take your uh, can openers and do both ends of a can. You would then wash the inside of the can, rip off all the paper, make sure it's clean, stuff the ends to the middle of it and squash it flat. And that way you could hold an awfully lot of cans. And cans were kept separate of other recycles and they literally counted them and were proud of how many cans they got. So um, that was interesting. And all the other recycling. If, if you were 10 years old, like my mother and my aunts, and you went into school on recycle day, you'd better have something. So dad would literally have to go out to the barn or to the garage and find some tools, something metal that they could turn in for this effort. And, uh, and it was no joke, you didn't go empty handed. <laughs> How embarrassing. And um, the newspaper, at this particular time, it went down to three editions per week, which was interesting. Here I am sorting all these newspapers and some weeks I didn't have very many, some months I didn't have very many. Due to costs and lack of advertising, they would do what they could and this too would change all the time. Worker strikes were everywhere including the Rouge plant. People would get angry. They would get angry about being forced to do certain things. They don't wanna to have to do them. So they would have sit down strikes, all kinds of strikes. And in March, the POWs were coming into Fort Custard. Now POWs, prisoners of wars, of course, these would be German and Japanese for the most part, and perhaps some others, Italians, uh, and they would be brought in to other cities, but Michigan being central in the US didn't have any until March. Then they would be distributed from Fort Custer on through, mostly to pick our, our crops. What else was going on in March? Well, all the movies that had come out in 1942 now were being given their awards. I guess it took that long to figure out who won actress of the year or actress, you know, the top actress, the top actor. So what you have here is Greer Garson. And this is where I wish you were all sitting in front of me and I could ask you what movie that was. And now I have to tell you, it's Mrs. Miniver, which is a war movie where she actually captures a POW. And when she gets that POW, no one believes she's got him. And when her husband comes home, it's just business as usual. She turned in a POW. A woman couldn't really do that. So it was very funny, but it was a play on women and what women might even be able to do. Also, James Cagney, before he took his tough guy role, he really was into um, dancing and singing. And he's in this called the Yankee Doodle Dandy. And he was the dandy. And these costumes are pretty dandy. Again, a black and white world. And then we have a very nice movie uh, that we all know and love, Casablanca. And this is not a scene from the movie. It is, you know, a, a, a poster. But still, the pictures are pretty much black and white because that's the kind of world we lived in. And uh, you probably know it had Peter Lorre in it. It had, um, oh, just you know, Bogart and Bergman, come on, this is huge. And uh, espionage, war and romance, couldn't be better. One more movie. 
And this is where I wish I could ask you, which Irving Berlin song wins an award from this? And he wrote 12 songs just for this movie. And why was the release delayed? Name for freedoms, because they're in the movie over and over again. Why was this not a classic? Now I have to tell you. Okay, it was White Christmas. I hope all of you guessed that. <laughs> Why was it delayed? Because, um, well, we were getting bombed in the Pacific Ocean, and it was Pearl Harbor when they were finally getting the last draft of this movie. It was going to be coming out in December. It's kind of a Christmas movie, but guess what? Everything got held up because now we're not just talking about being in the war. We are in the war. So they stop everything and say, Irving Berlin, we need all new songs for this. We want you to make a song for each and every holiday. That's why it's called Holiday Inn. He's got to do one um, for New Year's and for Christmas and for 4th of July and for Abraham Lincoln's birthday and all of the holidays as we and they knew it. And they had to do a song about the four freedoms and how it affected the world. And it is not a classic. And many of it's, much of it's been cut because it introduced Bing Crosby doing Abraham in blackface. And Linda was another actress in it. And she was in blackface, as were all of the behind the scenes actors and the band. I mean, like, it got cut almost as soon as after this was done. It, it was probably a mistake. Now, for the time, you know, there was a lot of sentiment, especially in the South, uh, against Black people. And uh, this just did not play well in the North and many other places. April 1943. Okay, we're out of March. And in April, unfortunately, April 1st, what a tough day. This is the day that my, the family that built my home, Claude and Helen Copeland, are informed of the death of their son, Robert Lewis Copeland. And who calls and tells them about it? Barry Goldwater, who then went on to become a famous politician. So he dies in Arizona and he's decapitated and he, it's in a training accident. You know, we weren't really good at planes. We didn't have an air force at the time. He was a cadet with the army and, uh, and he did die. He was the local boy. Personality, big as all outdoors, graduated from Mount Clemens High School, well known, well loved. And so it was a huge funeral. And Grosbeck Funeral Home is the one who hosted it. And it was their first non-Catholic funeral. Now, as the years went by, um, funeral homes didn't stick with religions. But up until then, they sort of had. And they laid him out in his home, in the home that was my house, up against the fireplace. And then he was buried on April 7th. He left Anne, a wife, a nine-month-old son, his brother, Gerald, that I already introduced you to, and his sisters, uh, a sister older than him that was Mildred, who was married and had children, and a younger sister of 13 years of age, Barbara. And how interesting that they were almost a generation apart with names that look like a generation apart, uh, Mildred and Barbara. Now, I was lucky enough to be able to contact Mildred a few years ago, and she told me this whole story and told me so much about what happened in that house that was her father's um, dream house. And so what did they do for him? Well, there was nothing more you could do for him. So they went and they got one of the brand new mausoleums in Clinton Grove Cemetery and put him in there rather than just put him in the ground, which they couldn't bear. However, his parents are in the ground to this day. And um, the irony, it kind of pervades. This is my house on the side of the house where the bathroom window is showing. And there's Claude. And Claude uh, didn't come from Michigan or Mount Clemens, really. He had come from back east. And he was at the Washington Monument for World War I, dressed up in his army uniform. And he met 
Helen, who did come from Mount Clemens and Michigan, and she was also at the, the Washington Monument, but she had arthritis and couldn't manage the steps. So she said, you all go ahead, because they were both with a group, you know, guys, girls, they were all together. Now, why was she in Washington? She had volunteered when World War I started to type. And she immediately went there because without copy machines and, and things like that, they needed her to type. They need lots of typists. They needed lots of women in the, the offices. So that's why she was there. But she never was paid as if she was in the Army. But she was essentially working for the Army. So she was there. He volunteers and says to her, well, if you don't want to go up the steps of the Washington Monument, I'm pretty tired today. I think I'll stay here with you. So while everybody else went up the steps and then came back down, they got to know each other. And when war was over, that one spark apparently lasted them a lifetime because he followed her here and built his house on Lodwick Street, worked at the pottery, and he was the foreman during the portal to portal lawsuit which occurred in 1943 and was really a landmark national lawsuit. I can't go into that, but I think it's really interesting how he struggled. He struggled to fit in here to get that house built during wartime when resources were scarce. And he also was fighting against the school superintendent who was having a house built over on South Wilson. And so very often he found that when a supply of wood did come in, it went to South Wilson and not to his. And so he tried to pull every string he could at the pottery to get household supplies, which is a, a whole story that we don't have time for tonight, but lots of fun. And so now we're in April and April is nothing but bonnets. Did I miss a thing? No, Claude. And then April. Okay. Bonnets and bonds. April bonnets and war bonds. Easter time. We're not giving up Easter. We've been doing Easter big since the Civil War, and we are not putting it on hold for this war. So how they advertise, tons of advertisements um, for a new hat. And you would have an imported braid straw hat, small enough to be dressy, simple enough for that spring suit. Several styles are available with gay flowers or velvet trims and a flirtatious froth of veiling. Let me say that again. Flirtatious froth of veiling to come over your face. You tuck it in behind your pompadour, behind your ear a little bit. They'll brighten up a dark winter costume and you can start your spring wardrobe. It came in dark colors and pastels and they were $1.95 at Kresge's. It's almost like a vacation, you know, when you're talking about hats and wonderful things in the war. But then we have to get back to the war. Okay, the war bonds. In April, we're going to start our second war bond drive. And Macomb County is told you need to come up with $1.8 million. $1.8 million. How are you going to get that? Well, you're going to get 800 gallons. Men who are going to launch this bond drive and drive it on home. And it worked. By June 1, just a couple months later, they had $3.7 million. And the population in Macomb County had really boomed. In 1940, we had 100,000. By 1943, 142,000. So there's a huge number of people that they could draw on for this money. Now, May, telephone cutover. First change in the last 62 years, the history of the phone in Macomb County. Exhibit A, my lovely phone, sitting in my little phone cutout at 122 Lodwick, sitting on a lovely little hand crochet doily is the phone that you did not have to talk to an operator for. You simply Turn that rotary dial and get yourself your number. Only four digits. Huge success. So now our phone books weren't just lists of people's addresses. They actually had phone numbers in them. And so did all the advertisements in the newspaper. In fact, it was all over the newspaper. If you could get a one line at the bottom of the front page that said, you know, Wilbur Service Station, 4122, you did it. You got it in there and people noticed it. 
phones were big. Flowers. Now, of course, Mayflowers uh, were so important. And if you notice, they did it so cute. Here's this little elf guy down here holding a whole box of roses. Another little elf guy. Roses were super popular. And this is Bright Mile. Brightmire Floral Company on Floral Street, which we still have a Floral Street. And they listed their phone number, exciting, and said, remember Mother's Day, that's in May, and maybe your mother's birthday, and maybe a wedding, maybe a funeral. All kinds of flowers, but roses. Roses were the cream of the crop and not that expensive. You could get them from Kresge, say it with flowers. You could get them from Frank J. Munt Flowers. Open all days, Sundays, May 23rd and 30th. So you should come and get what you need, pick out your geraniums, get your flowers. It was the big month. The May headlines. Well, we had a new air raid system and we had 40 minute blackout practices. I already mentioned those. Fridays at 11 o'clock and it would throw off that air raid sound and everybody uh, participated. We also had a huge army motorcade that came out of Selfridge and went all over our farmlands. They did a farm salute. They had bands, they had all kinds of, uh, you know, like Jeeps and what they didn't drive, they put up on flatbed trucks and made a parade out of it. It was the farm salute. They did this several times, but it made the May headlines. And now the next three things I wanna tell you <clears throat> in rapid fire, because I really need to say more about them, but they were so surprising to me, I had no idea. So first of all, the Selfridge Commander Coleman, 39 year old gentleman, shoots his 25-year-old colored, I quote, chauffeur, his enlisted man. Next thing, Peter Krug, good old Peter. He's a German POW that was over in Canada in a POW camp. He is now in Detroit in his full German outfit, complete with a hat. And he's in Detroit for the trial of Theodore Donay who is being accused of spying. And Peter Krug is saying, yeah, yeah, he was a spy. And uh, the next thing is the Selfridge Sentry, who happened to be a 24-year-old Negro man, I quote, shoots a white civilian trespasser who is literally trying to go over their fence. His name was William Hasse. He was 54 years old and he was from Grand Rapids. So I'm like, what, what, what? There's gotta be more to all of this. And basically, there is a lot more to these two, Coleman and Peter Krug, and I'll tell you the rest. But for this one, uh, he was exonerated. The sentry gave him fully three chances to get off of that fence, and he did not, and he was shot and sent to a hospital. He did not die. But it sure made the papers. They sure wanted to make something more of it than it was. We'll go on. June, big, big month. Our 39-year-old Colonel Coleman is now arrested for shooting Private William McRae. We finally get more names in the paper. We get more details. McRae was 25 years old, and he was in um, veiled secrecy or veiled information. Very little is being let out. And, and you know, that wasn't rare. We're in a war. We're not going to say much about much especially from the army. But, but this spawned rumors of McRae's death and that made the paper. Is he dead? Is that what they're trying to not tell us? And so what they did was they invited the Detroit News and the Monitor Leader into the base and they allowed them to interview McRae. So the reporters discover that, oh my goodness, here's Private McRae, and he's all smiles. He is recovering very well from a gunshot wound. And he had both stomach and um, like a wound to his stomach and a full infection of his, of his gut, peritonitis. But with the proper care that he got in that hospital, and he touted it big time, he was in really good spirits and he was healing quite well by that time. So thank heavens for that. But it was a it was a big deal. 
And he says he got a visit from actress Loretta Lynn. Now he recognized her face. This is a 1943 photo of Loretta Lynn. And she was out campaigning for her 17 minute um, video that was show business at war. I guess some people could call this propaganda, but it was to show that we really were all on the same page and to buy those war, war bonds. So Loretta Lynn, now McCray, he didn't know who she was or kind of what she'd done, but he knew she was famous. So he was very excited to be treated so well by her. And she um, was very glad to be here. And of course, you know, she got in the newspapers. Uh, she was going from really place to place, all these different camps and bringing along uh, her video, her, her movie and trying to bring some, you know, like, like good vibes for all of the men that were going on. Surprisingly, at this particular time, she's 30 years old. She has an eight year old daughter that she named Judy. Could have been Judy Garland. We don't know. I mean, it could have been named after her. Uh, but this Judy was eight years old and she always said she adopted her. But in fact, uh, during the same time period, Clark Gable came to visit this child. And years later, she claimed that that was her date rate baby with Clark Gable. And I guess that panned out. So um, date rape was not a known thing at the time. And she always felt it was her fault that she had led him on inappropriately and ended up pregnant. And uh, so it was very interesting how that all unfolded. So here she is. Moving on oh, to less lighthearted things, I guess, the Detroit riot. Um, we were having a really difficult time in Detroit. Southern whites and Southern blacks were moving up here in large numbers. We didn't have proper food or proper shelter. It was one of the hottest summers on record already in early June. And by June 8th, there was a small riot in East Detroit. It centered around a boxing club and it was kind of put down quickly and not a lot was in the paper. But by June 20th on Belle Isle, there was crowds that had begun fighting and it escalated into a race riot. Now it actually occurred over a long period of hours that um, racial tension was escalated with, I mean, we could talk for three hours about, about just that, that time period that uh, rumors were flying and people were screaming things that were not true. Uh, they were overturning cars, um, basically, like 20 cars got turned over in almost no time. So we had 36 hours of rioting, 36 were dead at the end of it, 1,800, 1,800 were arrested. Where are we gonna put 1,800 people under arrest? Almost any building that was empty was used. So we had several, I think it was six or eight policemen that were killed during this. And many, like more than 60 were injured trying to stop this. The National Guard was on Belle Isle. They shut down Belle Isle, wouldn't let anybody on it, which took away the one and only relief to Detroiters to get away from the heat. And FDR was called to send in reinforcements, uh, namely the Army. Now, how much and what he sent, I, I don't want to get into the whole thing, but I can tell you when it was all entered, done and over, it was investigated till October 29th. And at that particular time, they did convict Leo Tipton and Charles Lyons for instigating the riot, and they each got four to five years in prison, and not the 1,800 people that were in, involved in this. So um, there's so much we could say, but I'm just going to move on. This was a tough thing. It was in all the newspapers from end to end of the United States. It was a huge embarrassment, huge black eye to the arsenal of democracy. I guess we just could not get along. This is a picture of one of the buildings that they were holding some of these 1800. This is a picture of a trolley that is being invaded. And this is um, a uh, one of the newspapers literally from New York City declaring 23 dead in Detroit rioting, federal troops enter the city on the orders. <coughs> on a lighter note, other things were happening around the town. 
And one of them that was kind of comic relief in the newspaper was a theft, a theft that was reported to local police. And this occurred at the home restaurant on Gratiot and Utica, where a man forgets that he doesn't have his money with him. He orders a family dinner for his family. And then in searching his wallet, he realizes, oh, no, he doesn't have his money. <clears throat> he tells the waitress, uh, oh, he's so embarrassed. He doesn't have the money. But oh, my gosh, um, being that the food is hot, how about if he takes the food home and then has his son run back a $20 bill, which he knows for sure he has at home, and his son will return with the money. And she's going, oh, okay, yeah, hot food. Okay, you'll return. Oh, your son will take it. Okay. Uh, and then he says, but you know what? My son's only 13 years old. Maybe you could give me the change now so that he doesn't lose it. I mean, I can't be out that kind of money if he were to lose it. And she's like, oh, okay. So she opens up her till and gives him the change out of the 20, which she never got, and sends him home and waits an hour for him to come by. And no, nobody ever came back with the money. And so she called the police and made a full report, which made it into the newspaper. And it, it is kind of interesting that she was so trusting and willing to let that happen. $20 then was a lot of money. So, um, so that was like a joke and everybody thought it was pretty darn funny. Now, in the end, someone gave the money to the restaurant. So he wasn't out it or she wasn't out it, but uh, just an interesting time. Also, first in Macomb County, Eastland School over in Roseville opens up childcare. The childcare is supposed to aid the war working mothers and it will take care of children two to 13 years old for a full 12 hours a day and provide all meals. It will cost 75 cents a day and the rest will be covered from federal funds. Success. Not only was it a success, they had so many kids that within six months, this is June, by December, they had moved into a new facility, much larger, near 12 Mile in Gratiot. And so the newspaper, you know, they're full of this every day, every day. Well, what do you think about it? Well, what do you think about it? Should you leave your children here? Should you trust their food? Are you willing to pay 75 cents? So again, all these little details create interest. And they go to the superintendent of schools in Mount Clements. And they ask Wade Fast, dastardly man who slowed down my house. And <laughs> he says, oh, no, no, we don't need a child care in Mount Clements. We don't need a child care. We have real mothers. And that got printed. Much to the consternation of our mothers. Also on another lighter note in June, um, we have Charlie Chaplin in the news. Front page. It's hilarious. He is 53 years old and he's been known as the little tramp. Everyone knows the famous Charlie Chaplin. He is marrying Una O'Neill, who is only 18 years old. She's the daughter of Eugene O'Neill. So is Chaplin miscast as the sad little comic when he's really Hollywood's greatest lover? And in fact, he had been married already to Paulette Goddard, to Lita Gray, to Mildred Harris. Joan Barry was in this same article saying she was pregnant with his child and was having a long-term affair with him. But no, he's marrying Una. So Una, um, you know, is a beautiful young 18-year-old and she's all over the paper. They want to see what does this girl look like? And so this was her first big splash. She was an actress, but not a, a, a well-known mm -hmm. one. And so here she comes marrying him. They actually leave the United States because they're hounded. And he and she stay together for the rest of their lives. He ends up dying in 1977. They have eight children together. And by all accounts, we're very, very happy. And one of their children were Geraldine Chaplin who ends up starring in Dr. Zhivago. And then her child, Geraldine Chaplin's daughter, is named Una for Grandma Una. And she ends up being in a recent Crimson Fields. I think it was on Netflix, and it was about World War I, where she's a nurse. So he has quite a long legacy. However, when he did try to come back into the United States after World War II, 
They wouldn't let him. They said, he simply didn't have the morals we have here in the United States. Uh, we don't marry four different people. Apparently, they wouldn't let him back. July. July has lots of patriotic gestures. The Memphis Belle is pictured here. She's at City Airport. She's done 25 missions, 60 tons of bombs, and you can step on it if you buy war bonds. Also, there's a Jap two-man sub, and I quote, almost never did they say Japanese. It was always Jap, which we would take as a slur today, but they didn't in that day until sometime after the war. So this is a two-man sub, and we were terrified of them because they were blowing us out of the water. So you could get into that sub if you um, bought war bonds. Now, this is United Artist with Judy Garland, and it is down in Detroit, but that same sub did come through Mount Clements. I just couldn't get a picture of it. Uh, and then July, scrap drive to boost morale for civilians. I'm thinking July. They had this picture in July, but the kids shouldn't have been in school. And this is the seniors collecting all the, the, the metal that they could get together and putting in a big heap for a picture for the paper. And Russell Labarge, he is leaving the post in July of Macomb Salvage Chief. I didn't know they'd appointed him, but now that he's leaving, they are crediting him with 1,200 tons of metal. And he is ranked eighth in the state for his tin can um, salvage. So the tin cans were important, and I've already told you about that. Who's taking his place? A guy by the name of Joe Ernst. Now, Joe Ernst has to figure out something new to do. He can't do the same old thing. I mean, if he's taken all the metal earlier, Russell did, what's Joe going to do? Well, he says, I'm going to get 100 trucks, but he only got 99. And he sent out teenagers to drive those trucks and pick up whatever scrap they could find out into the farms. And what did they get? Well, they went out onto Selfridge and they actually took some of the seats out of a trolley. They were dismantling some of the things until they were stopped. And they had gone out in the farms and picked up mowers and some different things that looked like metal scrap to them. But the, the, the farmers wanted that back. So it was kind of a plus minus thing. A lot of it had to be given back. And that made the paper too. And also our county cannons were put in for scrap. Some years later, we retrieved cannons from down south and brought them up again. And that's what you see in front of the Macomb County building, if you go look now. Also during July, they replaced our copper pennies with steel. So you've probably seen our war steel pennies. And we had fronts, we had war fronts, we had strike fronts. And they literally were set up side by side like this in the paper because it was kind of a, you know, ironic thing. Here we're having war fronts. What are they doing in the Mediterranean? How about Russia? What's happening with these Nazi occupiers? The Pacific. But again, what's going on on the strike fronts? Well, Bridgeport, Connecticut, the aluminum pourers have quit. In Detroit, Michigan, there was a walkout of 2,500 city employees. In LA, Boston, Akron, all these places were having strikes. And again, we talked about that. It seems that under all this pressure, that's what was going on. And then we have the curious case of Max Stefan. I've already alluded to him once that he was perhaps a spy, we're not sure. And so his story is lapping over from 1942. In 1942, a gentleman who was a 22-year-old POW German is in Canada. He escapes and comes over here to Detroit. He immediately goes to Mrs. Bertelman's house. Why? Because she had been sending him care packages, feeling sad for these, I mean, a lot of these people were first generation German Americans and they felt bad for these young kids. This could have been her son from Germany. So she sends over care packages. He gets her address. He finds her in Detroit. She gives him fresh underwear. I don't know. That must have been the first thing a mom would think about. Are your underwear clean? Then she takes him to the German restaurant owned by Max. And they got to talk about this, probably in German. What are they going to do about this? I, what are we going to do with this kid? 
Uh, so he confers with his friend, Theodore Donay, who in turn gives him $20 for the train. In fact, there was way more than just Theodore. There was quite a few people that got involved with what are we going to do? Well, Donay's assistant heard him and turned him in. And then eventually Max is charged and convicted of eight to an alien. Not good. We didn't have any laws that said you couldn't help a POW, but we did have laws that you could not turn on your country. And he had turned on his country according to this. Krug gets sent out of Detroit. He says he's going to New York, but he ends up in San Antonio, Texas. Now, he not only didn't speak good English, he had no drawl, and they knew right away this boy did not belong there. So he was turned in by a clerk at a hotel, and Max was sentenced to die as a traitor. He loses all of his appeals, and he must hang. This is where the July part comes in, July 1943. Oh, boy. And they made the gallows. They had it ready to go. They practiced with the gallows to make sure his neck would snap. And so it shouldn't just strangle him. The paper talk endlessly about the act of hanging him. Now, the odd and curious case. Max says, oh, there's way more to it. A Detroit postmaster, for heaven's sakes, gave three bucks to get Krug to Chicago. And so every day there's some new wrinkle in this, which looks like all smokescreen or unraveling of a lot of stuff going on. A Methodist pastor comes forward and says, I have a petition, petition of 60 names to stop the death penalty. So he made headlines. But on July 1, the gallows were prepared. We were all ready in Detroit. Early July 2, FDR, our president of the United States, commutes his death and tells him he's going to have life in prison, which is what he does. He ends up dying there of cancer. So that is what happens to Max Stefan. Well, what about Mrs. Bertelman and Mrs. Stefan? They lose their citizenship for the duration of the war. And they are sent to a Texas internment camp. You may have all heard of the Japanese internment camp, where there also were other ones, German, so on and so forth. So um, there was a book written about it called No Ordinary Crime by Jay Wilson. And this is our Mr. Krug all dressed up in his hat and his, his beautiful outfit. They, they got it for him. I, I have no idea who orchestrated all this. And he came to Detroit several times to testify against these bumbling Germans who didn't help him so well. Very ungrateful young man. And Max Stefan dies in prison, Dunne gets five years, and eventually when the war is over, he is sent back home. Krug, Peter Krug goes back to Germany and lives out a long and fruitful life. Let's move on to August. We need harvesting. We need to start our canning. And we have 306,000 German POWs in the U.S., Let's get 5,000 to 8,000 of them sent to the lower part of Michigan to do our harvesting. And we got them. I guess they didn't keep good records because this seems like a wide range of 5,000 to 8,000. So they were placed in Fort Custer as a base and then sent out to camps. We also had some in the Upper Peninsula, but not out of Fort Custer. The POWs were placed at Army bases, including Selfridge where they actually left graffiti. And they went out to 12 different agricultural camps. And they had like tents set up at the site. These weren't really very good structures. And uh, Sparta, Michigan was the one that I became most familiar with, where they gave them pay, canteen privileges, and soccer balls to play with. And the locals came out to watch the soccer games and they embraced them. The women would bring out cookies and bread. So let's move on. What else is going on? Well, Japs, as they are known, are now working in our rose gardens. The Mount Clemens rose gardens were growing by leaps and bounds, so much so that there were laws that you could not earn that much on a, on a concern like that. And they had to buy some secondary business 
to kind of distribute their roses. So they bought the places that were now going to distributors, all the distributors, and but they were losing workers. They didn't have enough workers and there was no rationing of roses. Paul Weiss Sr. petitioned to bring the American Japanese families out of internment camps with the idea that they had all been farmers and would know what to do. And Paul used the apartments that were built out by his rose gardens and also a number of Mount Clemens rental houses. All along Church Street, right behind our current high school, is where quite a number of families lived. The kids were enrolled in our schools. They played on our baseball teams. In fact, they won pretty well, actually. And after the war ended, many more came to Michigan to be with their uh, Japanese extended families. And two of them, a Marshall Sermita and a Frank Segarra, spoke to the 12 High Club, telling them what had happened, how they were put into um, trains and buses and taken to internment, what they did while they were there, what it was like, how they got here. So there was a great deal to tell our local people about it. Here's our roses. This is what it looked like when they put them on a bus to bring them here. There's whole families, women, children, adults. And here's what the United States looked like in terms of where are the Japanese internment camps? None in the Midwest. So we had to make the effort to bring them in and we were asking for them from Amachi. Some of them were very difficult places like Topaz um, had uprisings and those things seemed to further our headlines that there were uprisings and that they really were ready for um, a fifth column or to be ready here when the Japanese landed in the United States and embrace them as the leaders. So it was, it was a very difficult time. Were they actually doing that? No, they were playing baseball, growing farms and going to fish in the East Coast, do farming in the middle. Of course, beet farmers, they did an awfully lot of that. And in Michigan, in Mount Clemens, they did roses. And here is young George Segarra, one of the sons, who is our class of 1950 from Mount Clemens High School, whom I had the pleasure of speaking to over the phone. And he told me the hardest thing about being in the camps was not for him. It was for the young parents who felt desperate that their children were there and born there in some cases. And what else do you do in 1943 when it's the summertime? Well, you have contests and games. And some of the local companies were sponsoring shooting matches with marbles, very popular. We were having a number of parades. And this one happened to be the buggy basket parade, the baby buggy parade, where you would decorate it and win prizes for your baby buggy. And everyone had one. And we had prizes for the largest cucumber, for the tallest sunflower, lots and lots of prizes. So that was going on. Let's move on to September. We're getting near the end of the year. Our Colonel Coleman here, he's got some issues. He was the one that shot his on. Uh, what they call the Negro, pro actually they used many different names in the, in the newspapers at the time, a private way back from May 5th. He is charged now with 29 counts under the Articles of War. Oh my goodness, what happened? He didn't just get charged with shooting someone or being drunk. It was way more than that because that opened the can of worms. It was a huge can of worms. When people started investigating what was going on, they saw how safe Selfridge was. And people recognized that. There was a transfer illegally of a Lieutenant Benson Ford, and it was completed, this transfer, all the paperwork in the office of Harry Bennett. Harry Bennett was considered, and I use slang, a hatchet man for Henry Ford. And so he is the one who orchestrated the Ford family's doings. And there was a court martial for Coleman and it was open to the press. His defense, amnesia, I don't remember this. Don't remember being in that office at all. So he was found guilty of four acts of drunkenness and careless use of a firearm. And he is ordered to a reduced rank and he goes to the bottom of the captain list. So that's exactly what happened to him. That was it. 
Number two at Selfridge, a Colonel, a Lieutenant Colonel Charles White, who is 35, an executive working under Colonel Coleman, is charged with more counts under the Articles of War. He is convicted of two counts of drunkenness and seven of gross carelessness. He was careless in transferring people to Selfridge and ensuring a stay there. He was accepting bribes of like $200 to ensure this stay. Seven times. It was careless. However, he was dismissed from service. The third identified man was Hartford. He was base intelligence. He is convicted of two counts of perjury and five of having defrauded the government from fake expense accounts. He's dismissed from service. Fourth man, Fred Lalone, chief clerk in the base adjutant's office. He is convicted of giving Sergeant Collins a $500 bribe to effect the illegal transfer uh, and seven charges of false enlistment or transfer of soldiers. Dismissed. Number five, Myron Collins, charged with accepting a diamond ring, a wristwatch, $300, and use of an expensive car that was owned by a George Lutfi, who is a wealthy Detroiter, and who had two sons that were stationed on Selfridge and guaranteed to be there. There were other things, too. I mean, they were giving these, these people um, that were in, in control use of beautiful cabins up north, nice cars to drive them, chauffeurs, all kinds of things. And so this guy was sentenced to 18 months in prison in addition to the four months he'd already been in the guardhouse. And at this point, finally, <laughs> the paper says, Secretary of War Stimson must investigate. This is going too far. And we have a third war bond. We are told how much money we have to get and our quota for Macomb now is 4.3 million. Harry Melvin from the furniture company is now our chair. And we've got groups of Goodfellows, Red Cross, and many other service organizations involved in that bond issue. It is the people's war loan quota, the people's for Macomb County, 4.3 million. And it is the third war bond. They know it's tough to squeeze blood out of a turnip, but we're going to do it. And they name this one Back the Attack with War Bonds. And the um, mayor of Mount Clemens writes a very lovely letter asking, please contribute. We must back this attack. Selfridge Air Force Base, they may have been feeling a little uncomfortable at this point. They had all new leadership and they took up a collection and came out with $2,000 to contribute uh, to the Macomb County collection and lots of new posters of which I couldn't get good pictures of. And these were more and more posters. You saw these in the windows of almost every business. We back the attack. We, this business, back the attack. We back the attack. Buy your bonds here. Even Hudson's got into the show. Hudson's came up with this lovely Four Freedoms War Bond show. Now, I've told you several times about the Four Freedoms, right? So they make this show, and it's on uh, the 12th floor at Hudson's Downtown Detroit in the auditorium. I didn't know they had one. And so they put out these posters, and they are literally dolls of of women, and it's a fashion show. It's what they wore yesterday in 1917 to 18, and what they wore today, 1943. So they put them in these clothes that they would wear, and look at how we've changed. We've got bib overalls, we're working. Uh, we do still have some dresses, uh, and these would be nurses and maybe working in cafeterias. So women in industry and what they would wear, their hats, their tops, their boots, their shoes. And down here, if you were part of the army or the Navy during World War I or World War II would be listed over here. And people came to see this show and it was presented quite a number of times. So it was kind of fun and interesting and patriotic. 
Now, Norman Rockwell, it's September, right? And I was telling you in, um, in really February and March, his famous paintings came out. He paints this. Again, 1943 is black and white. This is not in color. He paints the Liberty Girl, and she is beleaguered, just beleaguered with everything she must do now. She's been given uh, helmets to go in the service, all kinds of farm implements to go work on the farm. She's got hose everywhere. She's got surveying uh, things. She's got canteens. She's supposed to be working as a plumber, um, shovels, sprinkling cans. She can hardly walk for everything on her. And why? because this swastika is at her belt, egging her on. And so everything I've read about this particular picture is very interesting. Honestly, I never saw it after the war in, in my childhood. So interesting. We're in October now. Many of the homes in Mount Clemens are not really well cared for. You can see this picture that makes it into the paper. Actually, it wasn't the paper, it was a magazine. And this particular home has three sons in the army. And here are some of the ads that come out before Christmas. We will fight our country's battles. Of course, they're putting the Marines hymn in right onto their advertisement. What are they advertising? That's my question. I had to like spend a lot of time figuring this out. Rose Jewelry Company. They weren't saying come in and buy your diamond rings for Christmas. They were saying, we're part of the war. And young ladies, don't look for a ring. Be a Marine. Free a Marine to fight. Free a Marine to fight. I mean, like, I literally had to think about that. Of course, they weren't going to send women in. They would have office jobs. So fighting, symbols of a fighting America. That's what they were. Buy more war bonds. And that's what they were preaching. In addition, here in Macomb County, we had the 100th centennial of St. Peter's Church right here in Mount Clemens, amid all the war things, the grips, the Lipsig, all this going on. It's good work continues at St. Peter's. It's good work continues after 100 years. And here it is with the cars of the day, and it, it's quite beautiful. Now, I never knew this particular um, edifice because on 9-11-1957, it burned down. So this, this steeple came tumbling down and it was caught in motion and that picture uh, made it to the front page of the paper. So this is 1943 and they have everybody coming uh, to that particular thing, the, the priests, the local membership from all over 100 years. So let's move into November. Well, Claude and Helen move out of the dream house. They move over to a home on South Wilson. Dr. Campbell Ward moves in with his son, Robert, uh, who ends up being a doctor, and William Douglas and Peggy. And I'm still in contact with Robert and Peggy. She's at the front door of the home. And I have a picture of my own daughter at this front door uh, when she was about that age, Holly. Here is uh, Dr. Campbell Ward and, and Isla, and he started Mount Clemens General Hospital. And so they were very well known. And she has the perfect hairstyle for 1943, a little pompadour. And if we could just see her hat, it would please me no end. And in the paper, there were many famous passings. Um, J.P. Morgan died, uh, and a uh, former governor of Michigan, Edsel Bryan Ford died. Edsel Ford, this is the only son of Henry, and Henry has to go back to the shop and run it again. Dr. Alan Ray Defoe dies, and he had started the um, home for the Dion Quince, and he was really well known in our papers, and the daughter of Horace Dodge, Daphne, dies and we are fully in December. And they merge a lot of the holiday of Thanksgiving and Christmas together and say, save those ration coupons. Save your money to buy everything for a big dinner. There is nothing as comforting as families eating a big meal together. And they really press that home. 
Get extra ice from the iceman. Get extra dairy from your milkman. Get your pine boughs from out in your yard. Make dolls for the children. And you may use Christmas lights inside, but outdoor is taboo. And so I made up some Christmas outfits here that um, decorated my house for Christmas. And I tried to figure out what they would have done. I don't know if they would have had paper plates and plastic, but everything would be handmade. And this is the very best dinnerware that Mrs. Ward had for 1943. And here is the, the numbers that she would have left in the front picture window to tell them how much ice to drop off. You would have put your milk jars right up against the milk chute that all the homes had at that time, and you would have been allowed to make cookies for Santa. You would have made other toys, and you can buy inexpensive tin toys such as this Jeep. You can put these tin cans on your shoes, and suddenly you can be a tap dancer. You can pour uh, metal into molds and make soldiers. These were super popular. Or you could buy plastic ones and marbles and guns that really looked real and trains. Or you could make uh, a, a Buck Rogers um, stun gun out of a pet milk can and out of uh, um, the roller shade. You can make your own socks and you can hang up these socks while they're new on your mantle and then you can use them later. And here is um, a tree that has some, some patriotic things. There are actually dolls, paper dolls in almost all the books, clicker toys and guns, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Again, you could buy this. It was originally made in Germany, but then we were making our own. And you could spin this around and have some fun with it. And here's another shot of that Jeep. Hanging the socks, one, two, three, for the three children that lived here on a patriotic mantle. Here's the dining room. Roses, roses everywhere. Your very best. You shined, you cleaned, you folded, and you ironed your napkins and all of your uh, tablecloths. And every home had a place where they could do their wrapping. Wrapping of all the gifts. So I let them sit here so you could see how it was done. It would be craft paper or some kind of wrapping paper. They had bow makers that were very simple. They had string to tie them up with. And the big thing that people wanted when I talked to the men that grew up during this time, robes. They wanted to be warm. The houses were virtually cold back in the day and they didn't want to use very much heat. So that's what they really wanted. So with this, I would like to end my talk. Thank you very much for your long-lived attention of an hour and a half. And you are now leaving 1943 and coming back to 2021. Thank you. And as tomorrow is Veterans Day, I hope this has brought home a little bit of the hardship and the things that we could thank our servicemen and the people that, that lived at home that did for us during World War II. So thank you for your attention. And if anyone would like to make comments or questions, please feel free. Thank you, Bev. We've got a great program. Thank you. If anyone has a question and they'd like to ask it, you can unmute yourself. Oh, someone knew the answer, White Christmas. Thank you for saying that. You did. You knew it was White Christmas. That got the award, and it really put Irving on the map, you know. Um, it, it was amazing. So that was fun. But that blackface kind of spoiled it. And as soon as um, they started, you know, bringing the old movies back, they cut all that out of the movie. Was anything new to people? Did you think of something, or did you see something you just didn't know before? That says yes. thank you. I enjoyed the program. I, I had a comment. Yes. Uh, I learned a lot about rationing. Cool. I, you know, I remember when I was a small child being told that I had gotten into trouble for destroying cigarettes, which were apparently rationed, which my parents unfortunately smoked then. And I didn't know anything really about rationing of necessities, except uh -huh. I could have vaguely heard it, but that was so detailed. It really was very helpful. 
Thank, Thank you. you. You know, I tried not to get too far with it because I, I thought they changed it every two weeks, those poor people. So, uh, so thank you for that comment. Oh, it gave, my, it gave me some real empathy for my parents, who I wish I could share that with now. Yes. Um, because they really went through a tough time. I have yeah. a question. Mm -hmm. um, the gathering of Greece for munitions, um, even in the 60s, my parents still had a stainless steel basin around the by the uh, by the stove where they would still pour their grease in were were they compensated for like given uh ration stamps based on how many pounds of grease you turned in or was it there was a was there a reward system set up for that or you just did it out of the goodness of your heart you did it out of the goodness of your heart and you took a pledge to do what was best for the war effort and they had that pledge frequently in the paper. And every time you would go down and, um, you know, give money for a, a war bond, or if you were um, picking up your new ration stamps or turning in your old ration stamps, you reiterated that verbally. And it was to your neighbor, your friend, you know, that, that is working there. And so they really did have a hold on you. And you did bring in that, that um, grease. But, you know, my parents kept theirs. They still do. My mom, she's almost 90. She, uh, she would have a place where the bacon grease would be kept. And we would use the bacon grease to cook certain things. Then the rest of the grease would be saved. And she would never put that down a drain. That would just be awful, you know? And here we have this fatberg in Macomb County now. Why, why didn't we keep that up, you know? <laughs> we should have. But anyways, it relied on your, your goodwill for all this. And let's face it, if your son or your brother or you were faced with going off to a war, you'd want everyone to do what they could for you. So thanks for that question. Anything else? Trevor says very uh, Trevor's grandmother, excuse me, says, very interesting. Annette says, thank you. I enjoyed the program. Sherry says, well, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Rebecca says, so nice to see the history personalized to Mount Clemens. Um, Sherry made the comment, I did not know about the riots in 43. And then Paul has a question. Where on Wilson did Copeland's move to? Oh, um, I have a picture of them standing in front of the house and it has such amazing wood around it. So I went up and down the street and I was told it was 122 South Wilson. It doesn't exactly match. And so I don't know for sure, but uh, it would be interesting if they had moved from 122 Lodwick to 122 South Wilson. That would be ironic. And then they moved after that house and they moved on to um, Crocker Avenue. And I do know which house that is. It's a very large with white columns and uh, it's a very large home there that they moved there. She had arthritis and she really had the most difficult time getting around and they were very little for pain relief. And she was a very unhappy woman because she had lost her son. That I, and, and he was a very gregarious son. It just seemed like the one that was quiet and didn't have eyesight in one eye, uh, that was Gerald, he survived. And the one that was you know, right out there bigger than life, he died. And she just couldn't bear that that son died. Isn't that like a story as old as, as uh, Adam and Eve? And um, so she was horrified that he died. And every time while she was living in that house, she would look at the, uh, in the dining room or in the, the living room area where the fireplace was, she could still see his casket. I mean, they only stayed there a few months. She could not bear it. And she kept moving. So they moved to South Wilson, they moved over to Crocker and they kept moving. They must've lived in 40 different houses in the area. So I've got pictures of them, but that's all. If, if you know more than me, I'd like to know about it. I well remember the, 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 the uh, ration books and my mother saving all the grease but I have a question. Who? What was the name of the founder of Mount Clemens General Hospital? One of the founders was Dr. Campbell Ward. 
And him and his wife, Isla, had actually um, taken over a, a small women's hospital where babies were born and they scrubbed it and they put in a new furnace and they opened that up as the first Mount Clemens general. So it was him and some other doctor um, friends of his. And so then they broke ground, I think it was in 1955 for the new Mount Clemens general that you know over on Harrington. And where was the, where, where was the original one? Gosh, it was, I've seen so many pictures, but it was gone before I ever lived here. I'm going to, I'm going to pipe in on that, Bev. Please. Um, the original Mount Clemens General was on Macomb Street. Um, the building no longer exists. It was a converted apartment building. Um, and they moved to the new location, I believe in 1953. Um, or the current location. Of course, the hospital has grown a lot since, um, since the original building in, of 1953. But um, but having worked there myself for a while, I know what part of that building was original. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for that information. I worked at the former St. Joseph's Hospital, mm -hmm. um, which still exists as as a, a member of the Henry Ford uh, system. Right. Yeah, my um, my wife actually still works at. McLaren Macomb, but started at Mount Clemens General. But before that, she was a nurse assistant at Old St. Joe's. So she's told me stories about that building. Um, back in my ambulance days, I spent a bit of time in that building meeting with the finance department who happened to uh, be there at St. Joe's as they were, they were our co-owners with, um, with Mount Clemens General at the time. Well, I can, I can really uh, congratulate them on building such a large structure and such a small amount of land. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're growing again. <laughs> <laughs> Very creative. <laughs> of course, St. Joe's decided, St. Joe's got the CON to, to build more beds and they built, uh, they built West. <laughs> yes. I worked there. I worked there too. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have any place, any place in Mount Clemens to build it. <laughs> And do you believe that was back in 1975? Oh my goodness, I, that's the new hospital. So, yes. gosh, yeah. And, and it, you know, it's funny, but back in the day, uh, you really had to go to a funeral home that was your religion, or go to a hospital that would would satisfy your religious needs. And and we don't even think about that anymore. I mean, a, a whole group of Jewish doctors in um, Southeast Michigan opened up their own hospitals, which are now completely gone. We wouldn't even think of that, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, that a doctor can only practice here. But uh, St. Joe was like that. And you had to be, I think, Catholic or Christian or something to be there. And when um, when our Dr. Ward came through, oh, I know what, he was a DO. And yes. so <laughs> he had no place to, to do surgery and he was a surgeon. So he would have to travel pretty far to get to a hospital that was a DO hospital. So for him, that was the line of demarcation that he wanted a DO hospital. And again, today that really has no bearing, you know, that there's not a line there. So. Yes, I, I remember that distinction. Yeah. The DO, CMDs. Yes. Yes. Any yeah. other comments? Do you remember? Connie says, very nice and interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, Paul says, thanks. I don't know about 122, but my grandparents lived at 153 South Wilson. Ah. They were the Walters. Um, Rebecca asks, are you going to write a book about this, Bev? Oh, um, well, I hadn't planned on it. Did you want to uh, work with me on this? Are you a writer? <laughs> Always looking for fun things, you know. Uh, who knows? Okay. Uh, Paul says, POWs, did any Germans return to live in Macomb area after the war? Yes. I, well, for sure, a lot of Italian POWs that came here, returned here and lived at the Nine Mile and Gratiot area. And uh, that's when I learned what Italian weddings were all about that were quite fabulous when some of them married into 
my family that wasn't Italian. And oh my goodness, the Germans, you know, they 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 tried to escape from our camps too, especially from the Upper Peninsula. And I think there's a book, it's like called The Wolf or In the Jaw of the Wolf. And that's how we had all these POWs and there was a hierarchy in the POW camp and the Germans took over because they were certain that um, eventually, you know, the Nazis would make it all the way to Michigan and take over. And so they were going to be in control of these POW camps. And so they would make the other ones cut logs and, and do all the work. And some of the other ones were uh, under threat of death. And some of them did actually escape and come down to the lower peninsula and integrate and never go back to Germany. They knew Germans and uh, Italians that they would probably be killed if they went home. You didn't fail. You know, uh, you didn't get captured. You didn't fail. So a lot of them didn't want to go back. Nope. And I think the Macomb area has lots of those stories. Does anyone have a story like that? Hmm. Not here, not in this group, but they're there. Rebecca answered, says, no, not a, prof not a writer professionally, but it would make a good book. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, Larry, I guess I'll sign off then. Thank you. Okay. Um, does Thank anyone you very have much any for that very fascinating presentation. Thank you. Oh, here's a note. The Mount Clemens General Hospital was one building south of the roller rink on Macomb. Oh, yes. I remember the roller rink. Yes. Oh. Nikki was my neighbor. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's where the SVS uh, manufacturing building is right now. The big one. Really? Oh. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone have any questions? Not about the presentation. Anything genealogy wise? Yes. Is the newspaper database um, um, available? The obituary database is always available, but you got to remember that the Mount Clemens Macomb Daily papers are not digitized. So um, you won't be able to see that. Um, I tried to access it recently and I was unable to do so. Okay, well, let me share my screen. And Okay, so this is the Mount Clemens Library website. That's where you yes. went, right, Sandra? Yes. Okay, so under genealogy tab here, it pulls down. And you see Macomb History and Genealogy Databases. Yes. Okay. And you scroll down, and the obituary index is the second one. Okay. And then you, and most of the time, most people just enter um, a surname. Mm. Okay. And then the list comes up down here. And so what you need to do is copy down... <laughs> For information, the paper, the name of the person, the paper, the year, the month, and the day of publication. And then once the um, lookup service is given the okay to start up again, then um, we can look that up for you, um, or or um, Teresa or Brittany can. Um, but right now, officially, the um, lookup service is on hiatus because of COVID. It, it's on the services on what? The, the, the research services, this. Not, not available? Yeah, it's not available. Um, but but I, can, I can look it up myself? Well, you can look up the index, but, the you're, index. Not going to, but you're not going to see the newspapers because they're not digitized. Okay. I'm researching John Huber. And the last private owner of the historic house in the city of Fraser, okay. who died in 1979. H-U-B-E-R? Oh, I'm sorry, 74. H-U-B-E-R. Okay. All right, so it comes in alphabetically. 
Um, okay, John so John V. John v. There he is. Yep. So it's Macomb Daily, 1974, May 25th. So how do I access the actual text? Um, that is a little difficult because the service is down, but um, I'll get yeah. in touch with you. Oh, thank okay. you. And his wife, Petronilla, also born in Germany, was died in 1979. I've recently found their grave sites at St. Peter's in um, Denham and uh, Elizabeth Road. Down there. There's one alternative that we might be able to do but I, I can't say it right now. And um, I can't tell you for sure that we'll be able to do it, but I will check to see if these years are in that collection. Okay. I, I'd appreciate it very much. I'm doing this research for the Fraser Historic Society. Okay. For the Baumgartner house. <laughs> okay. Little... <laughs> All right. I will get with the person who has what I'm thinking of and see if we can use this alternate source. Thank okay? you. Thank right. you very much. I, I yeah. love being, I, I love this connection. <laughs> All right. Um, another thing that I forgot to mention in the announcements is what, um, if you look in the chat, I at the beginning of the chat, I had put in there, mentioned it at our last meeting, but um, we do have them playing with a volunteer genie in a box um, service since we can't do our genealogy volunteering in the library. Um, so you can fill out an appointment request, answer them questions so we get a heads up and um, we can um, hopefully help you out and give you advice on where to look things or whatever you need help with. Thank you so much. Yeah. And anyone else got any questions? Rebecca in the chat asked, any idea when the library on CAS will reopen? <laughs> that After was my next renovation. question. <laughs> <laughs> After the renovation, probably late spring. If I get word of it taking longer, I'll let you all know. Mm. Um, that is in 2022, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I know it feels like a really long time. <laughs> the COVID has something to do with that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the evening. Oh, um, I see Paul had a question. Um, is Macomb Daily found at any other library? Um, the um, Library of Michigan has some Macomb Dailies um, and earlier papers. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else closer. Mm, thank you. Um, thanks for the excellent presentation from Sharon and happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you for watching. Our next meeting is scheduled for December 8th, 2021. For our December meeting, our topic is what's new, what's different in our Let's Talk genealogy discussion format. Last but not least, MCGG extends its thanks to the Mount Clemens Public Library and its staff for hosting this Zoom meeting. Goodbye, everyone.